Hi, and welcome. My name is David Cunninger. I'm a director of R&D at Thermo Fisher Scientific, and it's my pleasure to share with you a data on the differentiation of IPSCs in 3D, leveraging suspension cultures for scale and efficiency. So we'll start with a brief background uh, describing uh, some of the features of a suspension culture uh, versus adherent for pluripotent for pluripotent stem cells. The <clears throat> figure that you can see starting for, from left to right, um, it's a diagram that, that shows basically if, if we're starting from a single well, uh, sorry, a single plate of pluripotent um, stem cells, uh, approximately 1.5 million cells, how we could progressively scale up uh, in the upper uh, flow. Uh, using a suspension uh, culture workflow uh, and comparing that to adherent cells. And, and what you can see, I, I think, is, is quite clear uh, at, a, at a high level is there are fewer steps uh, when one is going uh, the suspension uh, route, and, and there's actually much less plastic wear involved. And so, and, and as a consequence of this, <clears throat> less uh, media consumption. So, so it really, and this is uh, th these processes have long been used in bioproduction. So, this is um, really one of the key paths for the industrialization or the broader use of high numbers of stem cells uh, in, in a more uh, culturing them in a more efficient manner. So, one of the other features uh, that that's uh, important when one is thinking about suspension uh, culture is whether uh, the, the use of microcarriers or essentially whether the cells, the, the, the pluripotent stem cells would be cultured as adherent cells on a small micro supports that would be, um, uh, that would be uh, agitated in suspension. Um, versus uh, the, the approach where these uh, uh, self-aggregating spheroids are formed. So the cells are able to be seeded at a low density and form um, the self-nucleating self and self-aggregating uh, uh, spheroids in culture. And uh, some of the, the features of uh, both, both methods are uh, listed below. Um, so the, the microcarriers, why, why they can provide certain benefits, um, they, they do provide some, some, there are some real challenges with them, and I think particularly relevant to stem cell culture. Um, that is uh, particularly with respect to seeding density, uh, making sure that the cells are uniformly uh, uh, seeded, uh, grown, and don't overgrow on, on these, you know, thousands to tens of thousands of microcarriers that could typically be, be used. And as probably most of you realize that the uh, maintaining uh, both uh, <clears throat> it, in order to maintain pluripotent cell, cell health, um, appropriate uh, cell densities are, are, are really critical. And, and this, is a, this is a very tricky, it's, it's a challenge to do this in microcarriers, uh, estimating getting these cells seeded properly, uh, maintaining a uniform population um, uh, throughout. And, uh, and then just you, you have to, to handle this as an extra step with these microcarriers. Uh, in contrast, uh, suspension cultures, uh, the, the self-nucleating or self-aggregating uh, suspension cultures don't require uh, any type of microcarrier. And in this case, the cells um, can, um, you know, are seeded uh, directly in suspension uh, and agitated. There are definitely some, some challenges here in maintaining appropriate size, not letting these cells overgrow, uh, maintaining consistency consistency uh, throughout the process, uh, being able to, to passage and handle uh, it, it, to, to subsequently expand these cells uh, can, can pose certainly some challenges. And um, this is something that we have spent a great deal of time working on and um, is uh, really a culmination of our efforts is uh, uh, shown in this, uh, will be shown in the subsequent slides, and this is highlighted in our stem scale, uh, pluripotent stem cell suspension media. And I, I'm going to talk a little bit, because this, uh, this suspension media uh, may be new to, to this suspension culture approach may be new to, to many of you for, for PSC culture. I'm going to spend a, a few slides to talk about this system, uh, how it works, some of the uh, parameters that we, uh, that we modulate uh, to help control, uh, to, to gain consistency and control over the system, and then how we apply those, these expanded cultures, to a unique differentiation workflows. And that will be uh, sort of the, the culmination of my talk. So the, the next slides are, are really just, you know, how, how does the system work? 
Um, it, it's very, uh, we spent a lot of time trying to uh, make this uh, as straightforward and robust as we could. And, and so it, it's really a pretty simple, uh, pretty straightforward workflow. This is showing how one would uh, initiate these cultures, um, these suspension cultures. Um, we can uh, would typically start from a, from a monolayer, monolayer culture and uh, go into, depending on the format one wants to use, we can either go into a single well or multiple wells of a, a six well dish, in this case as shown in kind of the, uh, the, the center uh, of the slide, or inoculating a suspension, a, a, a flask or other uh, bioreactor type vessel uh, directly. And then essentially we'll just have every other day feeds um, uh, in this case, we have a 50% medium replacement, so we let uh, the cells uh, gravity sediment, uh, aspirate half the media, and then just replace it with fresh. Uh, very, very straightforward um, and, and easy. The, maintaining the, the consistent volume also helps us regulate uh, shear forces throughout, which is an important parameter. Um, this is, uh, slide goes into a little bit more detail uh, of the workflow and some of the other uh, ancillary or other reagents that are part of it. Uh, I, I want to stress these, uh, the suspension system uh, that we use. Uh, most of the data I'm going to show you is going to be related to shake, uh, shake, shake cultures. Uh, so so uh, agi uh, cultures agitating on an orbital shaker that's placed in a, in a CO2 incubator. Um, we have also uh, used a variety of bioreactor formats at, at, let's say, small to medium scale, and I'll touch on those also. Um, but it's, essentially, this is showing, again, the, the versatility of, of going directly into, you know, kind of a small to medium scale cultures. Uh, at the time of seeding and subsequent pathogen, uh, we do add a, a rock inhibitor is added uh, dur during the uh, seeding step. Uh, this is important to maintain cell health and appropriate uh, nucleation. Uh, some of the other reagents uh, and, and equipment that, that are required for this are, are as, I, as I mentioned, with the uh, um, a CO2 resistant uh, uh, incubating uh, uh, CO2 resistant shaker. Uh, it's important that um, one uses the right type of shaker here. <laughs> we learned this the hard way in that um, those that are not appropriately thermally shielded or, or designed to go in a CO2 incubator can actually convey additional heat uh, to the cultures, which can be deleterious. So, so having the appropriate platform is key. Um, we use uh, the Accutase, the Stempro Accutase as a dissociation reagent uh, throughout. And then uh, the tissue culture, so, so non-treated tissue culture flasks um, but tissue culture dishes, flasks, and as I mentioned, a variety of bioreactors are, uh, we show good compatibility and growth. Um, this uh, slide just highlights the, the workflow details, and, and they're, they're very, uh, in terms of immediate changes, it's very straightforward. We're doing, we're doing every other day feeds following seeding. Um, we essentially just let, uh, have a, a short gravity sedimentation to, to let the uh, agri, uh, so the, um, self-aggregating spheroids um, settle, uh, just do a, a straightforward 50% media withdrawal and then, and then replace with fresh media. Um, one point here that we found that, that you have a little bit, uh, you want to watch your time. We don't want to let these, uh, you don't want to let these cells uh, settle for too long because they do have a tendency to, to self-aggregate, uh, so to, to form these sort of supra-aggregated uh, structures where, where multiple spheres uh, can uh, sort of glom or adhere to, to each other. And so uh, just watching the, your, your time with this is, uh, is, a, is a good way to, to avoid that. Um, yeah, as I, I talked, so very, very straightforward <clears throat> in terms of um, seeding, uh, culture, uh, media changes. Um, again, we, we maintain constant volumes throughout the uh, culture period, so we, we uh, that this also helps again keep shear forces consistent. Um, helps us uh, maintain uh, similar speeds. Uh, agitation speeds or, or or paddle speeds, depending on your uh, bioreactor. Uh, so, so so the workflow, sort of the mechanics of the workflow, are, are consistent throughout, and really it sort of simplifies the entire process. Um, also, we think that um, you know the 50% media removal uh, really facilitates the, the weight waste accumulation, uh, removing waste products uh, versus batch feeding, where you, you're essentially putting concentrated uh, nutrients on top, where the, the cells are still bathing in the waste products throughout. Okay, and uh, so the next slide uh, highlights the uh, the workflow uh, of pathogen cells. Uh, this is very straightforward. Um, you know, we're essentially collecting the cells, uh, centrifuging, a brief centrifugation, uh, an acutase treatment, 
resuspension, and then going into fresh media um, with the addition of the uh, ROC inhibitor, um, uh, a cell count to make sure you're, you know, assure your, your uh, seeding density is appropriate, and, and then back into the, the new vessel. Um, I should mention that, you know, the, the working range that we uh, typically see uh, or, or, or seed the cells is at 150,000 cells uh, per ml. And our typical harvest densities uh, are, are about 10 times that or so. So we're, we're between one to one and a half million cells, uh, dissociated cells after the acutase treatment uh, per ml. So that's kind of the, the, the window, uh, the, the expansion window that we're talking about. And the subsequent slides will show more detail, not only what the, the, the cells uh, look like, uh, what, what the, the spheroids look like, but uh, some more numbers and uh, relevant data to the, the health of the uh, expanded PSCs. Okay, so um, yeah, so again, just workflow benefits. It's straightforward. Um, you know, we think there's there's really a limited number of manipulations. Um, no, no cell strainers. It, it's there's no additional equipment filtration straining that's required to do the uh, the cell passaging. And we think this is uh, really an automation friendly workflow um, in terms of how the, the vessels and cells need to be handled. Okay, and, and this is, um, <clears throat> so here's actually, so, so what do they look like uh, in culture? The images on the right show some representative of uh, sort of pseudo phase images of, of the types of um, what the spheroids look like uh, sort of at different times. And, and this slide is really meant to highlight um, some of the key parameters uh, that we've found to be uh, very useful uh, in, in kind of dialing in um, robust and consistent expansion. Um, that's going to be, you know, sort of shaker, uh, shaker platform RPM. Uh, you know, we have sort of a window, uh, 70 is sort of our preferred, at least with the, the, the recommended shaking platforms. They may vary just a little bit depending on, on the throw of the different uh, uh, platforms you may be using. Uh, or bioreact, it, it, again, the agitation uh, uh, mechanism may differ, so, so some of that might need to be dialed in. But for the shaking platforms, um, we look at uh, 70 RPM is, is really ideal. But, but as a rule of thumb, the, the higher the RPM, uh, the lower uh, you, you, you get smaller spheroids. Uh, so we, 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 th we think we get sort of lower, uh, smaller amounts of aggregation of these as the, the cells are, are, are initially nucleating and forming these spheroids. Uh, if we lower the RPMs in contrast, we get sort of more of that aggregation. And so uh, we, we tend to get uh, fewer but larger spheroids. Uh, the overall numbers and yields tend to be about the uh, very consistent, at least within the sort of a window of RPMs. Um, so again, so, some ways that, that you may be uh, useful to vary depending on your downstream applications. Uh, a culture that certainly the volumes can can, can uh, influence the size, uh, hydrodynamic forces. Um, you know, we have I, I think we have straightforward guidance depending on, on the vessels that you're using, uh, and seeding density. Uh, this is really um, you know an important one. You, you need enough cells to have this critical mass for, for for nucleation, at least under the conditions that that, that we recommend. Uh, the the low end of that uh, for the for the lines we tried tends to be 75,000 cells per ml, uh, where we would consider the sweet spot twice that, 150,000 cells per per ml. Um, and you can go higher. Uh, we, we've had uh, success doubling that, so uh, up to 300. But but 150 uh, k per ml seems to be a, a really good uh, uh, you know kind of a number to hit for uh, most of the lines that we've looked at thus far. So now let's uh, jump in and look at some of the uh, experimental data um, uh, generated with um, uh, the stem scale system. So uh, on to slide 13. So this slide um, it compares uh, this, we're looking across a single um, uh, line here. In this case, this is one of our uh, in-house uh, IPS uh, lines. And we're looking at the expandability of the cells uh, across different uh, vessel formats. So at the upper, so the upper left image shows a, a typical. Um, this is going to be our day four or day five spheroid. So so right before um, we would be typically harvesting these cells. And I'll talk a bit more on, on size and, and some other um, sort of parameters to that in a subsequent slide. Um, but what you'll see is what we're looking. Each of these bars represents the fold change in expand. This is fold change in cell numbers within a single expansion across the uh, various size formats. So the the um, the upper 
graphs in blue are with from um, a six well or even a, so so a six well plate or even using a 24 well plate and so this is a non-adherent so a suspension culture um, in in a single well of a 24 well plate which is about as low as we would uh, typically go and then if you look uh, below that we're, we're looking across a range of shaker flasks so starting from 125 mil flask to up to a one liter flask, uh, the culture, the actual culture volumes are, are shown below. But what you can see is a very consistent and robust uh, expansion uh, across a variety of formats. Uh, and this is quite typical of what we've seen ac across other lines and what a number of our early uh, ad adopters have seen. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Sorry, slide 14. Uh, we're going to look at the uh, the quality of the cells um, expanded, uh, the, the quality of the PSCs uh, expanded as spheroids in stem scale uh, media. And, and what you can see, so we're looking, at, in this case, we're looking at, at a couple of, of lines in the upper left, again, our, our GIPCO IPSC line, and then a, an NH9 uh, a line um, in red. Um, good maintenance of pluripotency, this is a continuous culture uh, in suspension out to passage five. Uh, if we look to the right, using the pluritest assay, we see, um, you know, a good uh, expression of, uh, you know, our, our genes uh, defining a pluri, pl the pluripotent state. Um, so, so good maintenance of pluripotency, um, a good expression of uh, OCT4 and NANOG. And then if we look uh, karyotypically at the cells using our uh, array-based uh, karyostat assay, we see uh, no uh, detectable genetic abnormalities uh, with the uh, expanded cells uh, out, 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 to five pa out to five passages here. And, and I'll touch on uh, in a subsequent slide a little bit further uh, level of expansion of what we've seen. Um, so uh, another thing uh, that, that is a, a useful parameter is the ability to culture um, cells at a variety of different days. Um, and in this case, um, what we have successfully uh, been able to, 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 to subculture, to differentiate and reseed and expand cells uh, uh, from spheroids that have been, uh, that had formed following a three days, four days, or five days in culture, uh, expanded using some of the basic parameters that I, I described earlier. So uh, as you might imagine, the total yields are going to increase if you let the, the cells, uh, you know, expand uh, an additional day or two. But you really have a, a, a nice flexibility in terms of when you want to, um, you know, if, if you're looking to harmonize workflows uh, or, or give yourself some consistency uh, on a, from a weekly schedule, um, it, it certainly helps there. Okay, so I'll move on to slide 16. Um, again, this is going to speak to consistency of, of expansion. Uh, particularly with respect to fold change, uh, looking across a variety of formats. So, so somewhat similar to what I presented with the different shake flasks uh, and, and formats. But in this case, we have included uh, two different uh, bioreactors. And f forgive me, the, the curtains are sort of our generic bioreactor uh, formats. We've looked at um, both uh, stirred tank and uh, some sort of paddle wheel type bioreactors. The results are, are, are fairly similar uh, with what we've seen um, with respect to fold change. So we feel um, what we've seen in-house is a good scalability and broad applicability across a range of uh, uh, culture formats uh, for, 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 you know, for suspension culture. So if I go to slide 17, um, yeah, so compatibility across multiple lines. It, this was a hard one to nail down uh, completely as, as, as one. There's an awful lot of different lines. In this case, we, we're looking across two different IPSC lines and two different uh, ESC lines. Um, representative images of those uh, before subculture are, are shown above. Um, the growth rates in terms of cumulative fold change, this is, this is three passage uh, expansion, uh, is shown in, in the graph to the left. Uh, and what you see is, is good and consistent growth. Um, you know, we do see certain cells, uh, you know, appear to do uh, better uh, than others, but, but that's really not expected. Um, and, and again, we're very pleased with the, the consistency that we've seen. Um, we've had uh, both between our, our, what we've looked at internally and, and other sort of early beta testers, um, you know, over a dozen lines uh, now that have, have shown uh, good growth uh, characteristics in, in, in the cell, uh, in this system. So I'll move on to slide 18 with that. Um, and this is, this is really looking at longer term maintenance of uh, cells in the system. Um, we actually, uh, so, so in this case, you've got um, representative images of the spheroids um, 
at, uh, if you go from on the left side of the slide from the uh, sort of top row to the bottom row, we're looking at passage five, passage 10, and passage 15. Um, uh, this, this work was interrupted because of our, our COVID-based shutdown. We've actually, we're in the process of carrying this work out to 30 passages. Um, uh, but, but what we've seen out to 15, um, we've done sort of full characterization as, as the cells. Again, we see uh, robust growth and consistent growth and consistent uh, morphology of the uh, spheroids. Um, and also a uh, maintenance of pluripotency uh, across the, the passages as, the ter as, as sort of indicated by uh, OCT4 and NANOG um, ICC. And, and I should mention when we are uh, using the pluripotent OCT and NANOG expression um, is determined by flow cytometry. So, so in this case, we're dissociating the cells as we would through the normal passaging and then just doing um, uh, 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 staining and flow cytometry to, to, to get a population-based count. So if, if I go to slide 19, um, let's talk about differentiation. We'll, 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 we'll jump into this uh, a bit. So slide 20, um, I, thought, I thought I would lead uh, with what we have found to be uh, useful parameters um, for adapting uh, differentiation protocols that were designed for, for 2D culture to 3D. And, and so this is you know, somewhat similar to, to the, the, the guidance, the sort of key parameters for the, the culture of the I, um, IPSCs in, in the, with the self-aggregating uh, system. But, but in this case, we're, we're talking about, you know, once we've expanded a, a population of cells that we want to differentiate, what, what are some of the important, uh, you know, considerations uh, as, as we're, you know, dialing in a differentiation uh, protocol? And, and there's a couple straightforward ones that, that we found, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on these with some, some real life examples and subsequent slides, but, but so spheroid size. So uh, just as I mentioned earlier that we, you're able with the stem scale system to subculture the cells at day three, uh, four or five. Um, uh, so in, those are actually, so spheroids at those uh, different days in culture are of different size. And so um, the number of cells per, per aggregate uh, varies. And so we have found that this is, this is actually a useful parameter to consider. Um, so what, at what day do you want to, uh, what day following initiation of the culture do you want to uh, start your, your differentiation uh, uh, process? So, so this, um, and, and I guess I, I think of it as, as it's, it's not exactly, uh, I think, comparable to relative confluence in 2D, but, but I think it's a first pass approximation and, and we found it to be a useful uh, consideration and step when we're dialing this in. Uh, duration of the uh, quote unquote steps. So this is the time uh, that one would be doing with a 2D culture. H how long uh, are the cells incubated in a given media uh, for an induction, expansion, a, a differentiation or, or maturation phase? And so um, often we will start with, you know, whatever works in 2D is kind of our jumping off point, but, but also look to vary, um, vary those steps, either extend or, or shorten them. Uh, to look for uh, optimization. Um, and, and again, uh, a Shaker uh, platform RPM, I think this, this is an important one also, and it, it may depend on really what types, of, how long your differentiations are, if you've got a lot of proliferation, if the size and the mass of the, the, the spheres or these differentiating uh, 3D structures is going to change a lot. Um, it, it, it may be useful to, um, uh, you know, modulate uh, Shaker platform RPM uh, to, to accommodate for, uh, for the uh, morphological changes. Okay, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll move to slide 21. Um, I'm going to give, this is the first of uh, two broad examples on, on differentiation. Um, this one, we're looking at di directed differentiation um, from the you know, pluripotent state to um, definitive endoderm. And the, the graph at the, 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 upper, the upper half of the slide shows, you know, wh wh why DE, why, why definitive endoderm, um, why, why is it useful, um, who cares? And, and it's, it's really, um, it, it's a requisite upstream step to uh, many, many, uh, uh, useful types of endo downstream endoderm um, uh, cell types, which are sh shown on the, on the far right. So pancreas, pan pancreas liver, gut, thyroid, a lung, uh, for example, all, all our endoderm tissue and can go through, d developmentally go through the definitive endoderm step. Um, so if I go to slide 22, this is actually, so we developed, uh, you know, a, a product uh, for the, 
induction of the definitive endoderm state in cells in monolayer. And this, I just pulled the, the product, the, the protocol from our product manual. And, and it's, it's actually, it's a very simple, it's a very straightforward protocol. It's two days, it's two media, it's two days. It's, it's very fast and, and, and rapid. It usually works quite well uh, in monolayer. But, but I wanted to highlight one thing. And, and so that is uh, what's shown in, in yellow in the center. And, and that, what, what we had found is that the starting confluence is really important for the monolayer-based differentiation. And in fact, for us to get robust and consistent differentiation uh, in uh, sorry, induction of the definitive endoderm state, um, that the, the starting confluence is, is critical. Um, so now if I, I move to uh, slide 23, and this is an example of um, the differentiation. So, so this is using our same def definitive endoderm um, uh, reagent, our kit. And, and starting with um, spheroids, so we've expanded, uh, you know, I, IPSCs in, in our stem scale media. And in this case, what you can see sort of graphically is we've, we've expanded the cells following seeding, uh, nucleating and forming these, these spheroids. Uh, we've been started the, the induction here at either day two, day three, or day four. And the, the images represent, you know, different size spheroids uh, th that, that we've seen. And so... Um, and then if we, we just treat them, walk these cells through our, uh, the, the DE protocol, um, just as we would in monolayer, so no, no, no changes in timing or anything. And then we look at the, the outcome of that process in 3D. And, and in this case, we're looking by flow cytometry again, so we're dissociating the cells after the, the 48 hour process and staining for uh, CX, CR4 as an indicator of um, the definitive endoderm population. We see very efficient differentiation, um, much like in 2D, but in this case, we see it uh, really at, at, at across um, the various size spheroids. So, so again, uh, suggesting that, uh, you know, increased flexibility um, in, in terms of uh, starting density or starting numbers of cells in, in the population of these spheroids. Uh, we had sort of broader, uh, a broader range of starting cell size uh, in, in terms of the number of uh, cells in the spheroids that give us the same highly efficient differentiation. And this is quite different than what we see in, in monolayer, which there's a much stronger uh, uh, correlation to a, to a rather narrow window of cell, uh, uh, relative cell confluence. So if I go to slide 24, I'm gonna switch to, um, I talk about uh, neural, uh, so neur neural induction or, uh, neural differentiation. And, and the, the panel at the uh, top the, in blue on the upper left of this slide shows um, the workflow, the upper, the upper figure, uh, it's indicated as 2D. This is the protocol that goes with our, our neural induction media, which is uh, shown at the upper right. And, and this is a monolayer differentiation. This has, uh, it has an induction step. It has an expansion step that requires several passages and, and then a maturation phase, all done in monolayer. Uh, it's quite long. Um, we get very high quality cells, but, but it's, it, it is a bit lengthy. Um, now, what we've done below uh, is, is what you can see sort of in blue and green uh, for under the 3D is we've varied, uh, in this case, the timing of either the induction and expansion phases um, of these, all within 3D, all within the single culture. And, and what we've what we've been able to, you know, we've been able to find is that, um, again, th there's, this type of optimization we find to be quite quite useful in terms of uh, dialing in um, conditions that were appropriate for or, or worked well for 2D. How do we adapt it to 3D? Um, uh, but what we have found is that we've been able to sig significantly shorten uh, workflows in 3D uh, relative to those in 2D. So, uh, for example, the, the slide, if, if we look um, below the panel on the left, that shows you images of the spheres um, uh, initially when we were initiating the differentiation, the next uh, sort of phase image over, shows uh, the cells um, prior to the um, actually replating in the maturation media. So the cells have expanded and, and they've sort of changed their shape a little bit. Uh, during this process, um, I, at this point we different. Uh, sorry, we dissociated the cells and went into monolayer uh, as it's uh, for the maturation phase. As it's uh, more straightforward for us to um, assess uh, the rate and extent of differentiation. Um, but but we, what we were found is that we were able to get 
um, cells that were um, equivalent to or better uh, 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 percent of differentiation um, in a shorter time compared to uh, in, in the 3D workflow relative to that in 2D. And, and this is something that we, we're, we're beginning to appreciate with the system, the, the, the ability to toggle between a, a 3D state and a 2D state, uh, depending on what your needs are. Uh, and, and, you know, kind of what, what the experimental outcomes or, or goals are, um, the ability to, to bank large numbers of cells uh, prior to, to, to differentiating for, for quality control or standardization uh, aspects. And then finally, I'll go to um, slide 25. Uh, this is actually quite similar uh, to the, the, the slide I just showed. This is actually using a different type of, um, it's using a different neural differentiation system I, I, instead of uh, the more uh, general neural populations that are uh, developed or that are generated using the neural induction media. Um, th this data shows the generation of a very specific neural subtype, these uh, dopaminergic neurons. Um, uh, the slide's laid out very similar. Um, so you see the, the standard our, our two workflow for this uh, product shown um, shown above in the in the upper left. And then when we where we've basically adapted um, or looked to uh, uh, modify the different steps. This is either the induction at the four four plate specification in purple, and then the expansion step uh, shown in green, modulating that uh, going straight from 3D. And, and what we're able to, to see is that we get, uh, similar to the slide I just showed, we're able to get uh, equivalent efficiencies in terms of the uh, percent of these uh, floor plate progenitors, as, as, as indicated by FOX A2 and OTX2 staining. Uh, these are the sort of red and green uh, images in the, the, the middle lower section of the slide, as, as well as um, uh, you know, a, a robust population of these dopaminergic neurons um, at a, a substantially reduced time uh, timeline than, than what we saw with the standard uh, just monolayer-based protocol. So uh, it certainly doesn't mean uh, all of your differentiations are going to be accelerated. We've been excited and, and pleased to see um, the benefits, certainly with the neural differentiation uh, that, that we've done thus far, uh, starting with the uh, expanded steroids. And so lastly, I'll close with uh, slide 16, uh, I'm sorry, slide, slide 26, really just high, uh, I, th I think key takeaways of the system. So um, again, our, our stem scale PSC suspension media, um, we hope offers a simplified, uh, you know, a workflow. Uh, it's not very complicated uh, uh, to use. We've had a, a, trained a, quite a few folks on it. Uh, it's, been, it's been readily picked up by, by folks even who have no experience with suspension culture. Um, we, we've seen uh, terrific luck in terms of scalability uh, across various uh, types of formats. Um, we haven't gotten into multi-liter cultures yet. This is something we're, we're still, um, we were delayed by the COVID shutdown for some time, but we're, we're gearing up for that. Uh, high quality cells across multiple passages. Again, we, we've been, um, I showed data out to passage 15. Uh, we're looking uh, at double that uh, right now. And then the downstream differentiation. Uh, we think that we've got, um, we've been able to see a straightforward uh, adaption of 2D differentiation protocols uh, using 3D. And, and what we think we're really excited about what this enables is highly efficient and scalable generation of downstream cell types. Um, and uh, well, I thank you uh, for your attention and interest and I'll, um, I'll wrap it there.